half in the bag. Why do they keep making movies? Yeah, well, why don't you check that list again? Yeah, I'll wait while you check it. Mike and Jay. Is he checking it? Is he checking it? Yeah. Nothing? What, for, what the fuck? This is unacceptable. No, I'm not drunk. You're drunk. <laughs> fuck that guy. Yeah, fuck him. Finally, the world has opened a VCR Hall of Fame and exhibit in Toledo, Ohio. We weren't fucking invited to it. God damn it. Don't they know that we've been busting our ass being VCR repairmen for the last eight years? Not to mention we have one of the few remaining operational VCR repair shops in the fucking world. Don't they know who the fuck we are? If anyone deserves free tickets to a soft opening of the VCR repair museum, it's us. God damn right. From exhibits to the very first VCR built by Aberdeen Schmeckeldorf in 1948 to the most current released model, and the history of VCRs, the impact on pop culture and American life. I mean, God damn it! I want to see those exhibits. We've done more for the name of VCRs than Toshiba. In fact, Jay, you could say we've done more for the name VCR than Mr. VCR himself. Was that somebody's name? I, th I think it's. I think it, I think it's shortened. I think it means something else. V Victor C. Rumeldorf. I always thought that's what it meant. Does it stand for something? Is it an acronym? Where did you even get that name from? He's the guy who invented magnetic strip tape. <laughs> See, Jay, this is why we need to go to the soft opening of the fucking VCR museum. We're not frauds just pretending to know everything about VCRs for money. We know. We know our shit. We're the only VCR repair shop that's approved by these companies. And we are are approved by Sony and Panasonic and Toshiba. We've got the fucking stamp of approval to fix their VCRs, and we don't even get an invite. Have we done this long enough? Oh, should we talk about Godzilla now? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. The bit, I mean, yeah. Yeah, all right. Yeah, we'll talk about Godzilla. Godzilla, King of the Monsters is the sequel to the last Godzilla movie. No, not that one. The one before that one. The only recent one that matters because it's American and we invented Godzilla, damn it. King of the Monsters is about Godzilla fighting a bunch of other monsters. Some boring human characters do some boring human stuff too. While Godzilla is busy fighting a bunch of other monsters. What else can you say? That's the movie. That's the review. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Uh, Mike, what did you think of Godzilla, King of the Monsters? Uh, I didn't hate it. It should be pointed out that both the movies we're going to talk about have, on Rotten Tomatoes, they have very low critic scores, but pretty high audience scores. And I think the reality for both of them is kind of right in between that. That's true. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, to jump ahead to our next film, I also enjoyed Dark Phoenix. Um, but I wanted to coin a term, and I don't know if it's been coined yet. I have not Googled this. It probably has. But I want to say, we, watching these two films, both green splats critically, I wanted to call them flop busters. <laughs> because they, they come out and they're like, oh, Godzilla is 40%. It's terrible. And then it gets good high ratings. And then I look on Box Office Mojo and it's like, eh, eh, 120 million opening worldwide. Well, Godzilla didn't make that much. Oh, maybe worldwide. Worldwide. In US yeah, yeah. it made like under 50 million or something? 57, okay. 57, 60, uh, you know, 100. Well, I, I don't trust the budgets on, I, I, I'm assuming that's a guess. I, I don't yeah. know, who knows? But um, it, it might be one of those that squeaks by or underperforms, whatever. Yeah. That's why it's a flop buster. Sure. Because it does pretty good, um, but it's not a disaster. It's not a Jupiter ascending or, you know. Right. Uh, and it's also not a, a, a Marvel uh, Avengers Endgame. <laughs> and, and I have a feeling Endgame will be the last true blockbuster. Ooh. I, I just, and it's appropriately titled, too, um, because I can't think of something. I mean, you, sure, you got this new, new Batman movie coming out. New the, Star Wars, Star, new Star Wars. Star, when, when I saw the last Jedi trailer, I was like, oh, where are they going with this? I'm interested, because, you know, it's following up The Force Awakens. What's happening in this? And then this, it's like... <laughs> I watch it and there's Ray, yeah. still wearing the same clothes, <laughs> on the desert. Another desert planet, uh, yeah. Nah, nah. Here, oh, we have the, 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 the usual Falcon flying shots. I'm surprised it didn't attack two or three TIE fighters. 
mm. pursuing it, shooting at it. Yeah, that's every movie now. It's all it's all the same. I think. So, well, I think that's that's what both of these movies are talking about. Kind of suffer from is the fact that nobody's impressed by anything anymore. Everything's gotten too big. Yeah. Where now you have these movies that are okay-ish, but it's like they're they're not uh, Infinity War. You know, they're not like. This, this grand epic thing that's gonna like get people like riled up in their seats. They're okay. I don't know, in the foreseeable future, I can't, I can't really see anything because the, the, the DC model burnt itself out. The uh, Universal movie monsters <laughs> self-destructed. Um, uh, Batman, uh, Superman, uh, restart. X-Men. X-Men's gonna be rebooted now. Uh, X-Men's in flames, yeah. no pun intended. Uh, so it's like, yeah, what, what, what's going to be this next big thing that's going to bring worldwide audiences out? All these, all these IPs are all like in, in ruins. Uh, so I, bet, like, I bet if you asked uh, people leaving the theater from this Godzilla movie, did they, if they knew it was a part of a cinematic universe, they probably would have no idea. Most people wouldn't. This is related to that Kong movie that came out? I think I saw that. It was okay. Kong Skull Island? Kong Skull Island. It yeah. is? It is. See, you didn't even know. I didn't watch it. <laughs> You know what? And while watching this, uh, I could not remember if everyone in this movie was in the previous Godzilla movie. All, the only thing I knew was that Brian Cranston was in that. I, I wanted to quiz you on that. Because I, I, uh, after we saw this, I rewatched our Godzilla 2014 review. Because I don't remember anything about what we said about it. Um, and I was surprised because we show trailer footage in that review. Uh, and I was like, oh, uh, Sally Hawkins from Shape of Water. She was in the last movie. She's in this movie briefly. I recognize Ken Watanabe. Ken Watanabe, he was in the last he, one. He famously says, Scorchzilla, like, like they do in the old movies. Right. Not being racist, <laughs> that's the way he says it. <laughs> so you could stop your comments right now. The early edition guy, the, the lady from The Conjuring. Vera Farmiga. Of course it's Vera. Everybody loves Vera. <laughs> Vera loves her paychecks. <laughs> uh, uh, and I was like, was she in the last movie? I know the, the, the little kid from uh, Stranger Things was not, because that's when she was born. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but let's, uh, let's brush aside our cynicism, <laughs> our discussion of, uh, of, of franchises and cinematic universes and properties and all that stuff. Let's just talk about the movies. Uh, Godzilla 2019, AKA Godzilla King of the Monsters, which is sexist. Because uh, we don't know Godzilla's gender. God, Godzilla's a male. Well, he could be gender fluid. <laughs> no one can understand. <laughs> I guess Vera Farminga kind of can, but she never asked him if he was gender fluid. That's true. And she just wanted to get him to calm the fuck down. <laughs> <laughs> but, but she didn't ask him his preference. Yeah. So... Uh, so I guess the movie takes place a handful of years later. Uh, 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 Vera Farminga and the guy from Early Edition have two kids. They have a son, I guess he gets stepped on by Godzilla. <laughs> so at some point he dies. So then that kind of tears their family apart. The, the father is an alcoholic. He goes off to like learn the, the hunting habits of wolves. Uh, she's, uh, oh, whatever. <laughs> well, well that's, that's the thing is the... They, they took note from the last Godzilla movie, which had almost no Godzilla in it. Um, and they said, let's have a lot of Godzilla in this one. Lots of monster fights. We got Mothra and Rodan and Ghidorah or Ghidorah. We'll have tons of monster fights. Oh, but I guess we have to have a human element. So we have this, this, the most stock of family drama stuff that we've seen a billion times. That, that uh, yes, I will agree with you to a certain extent. The... Um the family drama felt very Roland Emmerich. Uh, Which is funny, because we say that exact same thing about the last Godzilla movie. Sure. This one, I think it's even more so, because you have, every Roland Emmerich movie has the, uh, the strained uh, parent-child relationship. Mm, the strange dad who and, wants to win back his family. Yes, and this has that, and so you're like, oh no. And then the movie never really does anything to flesh them out or make them much more interesting. Vera, Vera Farmiga the most, although she goes so far uh, crazy at one point where you're like, I think you even said, you're like, she better not be redeemed at the end, but you know where it's going to go. And it's like, please. Well, th that's the problem with a Godzilla movie. Uh, like, I, I could under, I, I'm not a big Godzilla fan. 
I don't even think I've seen a Godzilla movie. I've seen pieces, sure. except for the Brian Cranston one. But yeah. That doesn't count. Um, but through osmosis and pop culture, I'm aware of Godzilla, Mothra, Rodan, oh, sure. Mecha Godzilla, Monster Zero. You know, hey, uh, I've lived on this planet. I've absorbed pop culture. I know what those things are. So going into it, watching it, it's Mothra. Everyone knows Mothra. Yeah. Everyone knows Godzilla. And so it's like they, they picked out the three or four big monsters that they wanted to highlight. They explained to us their, their dynamic, their social dynamic. Godzilla does not like Monster Zero. They're the two alphas that rival for control over all the other monsters. Mothra's the wild card. She kind of has a special bond with Godzilla. Uh, I got all that. Yeah. They explained all that, and it was clear on who was fighting who. It wasn't a Michael Bay Transformers movie. Which, uh, a little too much murky rain and snow stuff, but yeah, Fine. you still get a sense of what's happening. I, I, was, I found the movie very exciting uh, up, up, up until maybe like the halfway mark. That, that when they go to Antarctica, that whole sequence I thought was neat. Oh, yeah. Um, there was a lot of stuff, uh, first half that was great. Um, and then it's like, okay, you know, yeah, yeah, your balance. We have to have human characters. We don't want to bog it down like we did the last one. Yes. With too much exposition, too much drama, the people talking, blah, 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 blah. So they sprinkled it in throughout and they had four or five monster set pieces. I thought the ending went over the top. And, and that leads in, into the Dark Phoenix discussion because I thought the Godzilla movie, I was so like, I'm so sick of movies that overstay their welcome. Yeah. I like a, uh, when things scale it down a little bit. Well, this, well Godzilla, you kind of have to do that. Th I get th that. This gets a pass when it comes to that stuff because that's that, Godzilla's yeah. whole thing. Um, and uh, like you mentioned, you, you get to understand the uh, dynamics of all the monsters, and that's really, because this movie is directed by Michael Doherty, who did uh, our, our favorite, Krampus. Krampus is a masterpiece. Uh, he clear cinema. that trick or treat. He clearly likes monsters, mm -hmm. and you can tell that's where a lot of his attention went to in this movie, and the characters are almost like an afterthought. Yeah. Um, because this does a really great job. They're not just mindless monsters that start stomping around. They all have, like... Uh, behavioral patterns and lots of detail and attention to that type of stuff. Yes. Just them acting out their, their general nature. They're not just yeah. big, stupid monsters. Right. Um, Ghidorah has the three heads, and they all have different minds, different personalities. Mm -hmm. They don't even make a line about that. You just kind of pick up on it. because well, like snapped at the other. Like, yeah, trying, yeah. Trying They're like, they like bicker with each other. and So you can tell like that's where all of his attention went. And I think all the battles are just the right amount of excessive where they're not exhausting. Right. Um, it, it, it didn't get Man of Steel. <laughs> My favorite part, I laughed out loud twice. <laughs> First part was when the pilot ejects from the thing right into the monster's mouth. That was the best part of the movie. Some, uh, some joyful monster stuff. Also, Oh, I laughed out loud three times. Oh. When there's the guy, in, in the early scene when Mothra is the larva stage, mm -hmm. and um, there's the guys with the guns, and there's this giant, like, fucking larva monster, like, right, and then they're like, ah, ah, and, and then Vera Farminga yells out from behind the glass window, stop it, you're scaring her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I want them to turn, bitch, are you for real? Like, just say that, like, uh, I, I don't blame the guy. Yeah. Yeah, um, so that was kind of funny. And then lastly, uh, Boston, it looks like an atomic bomb dropped on it. And then uh, uh, early edition guy gets out of a car and he starts going, Millie! Yeah. Millie! Uh, uh. Yeah. There's two giant monsters fighting and, and, and like barfing fire at each other, but... <laughs> Can you hear me? A, a cacophony of noise yeah. and a, a destruction and fire and brimstone everywhere. And that, that's like I said, every time they pan down to the, like it's I understand true. what they're doing. You gotta have the, you have the big action, but then you have the human drama at the it's, center it's of it. It's not as laughable as that Man of Steel moment when, when the entire city's being blown up and then they pan down and the camera zooms in and, and there's uh, Lawrence Fishburne and someone has their shoelace caught oh, yeah. on, under under a piece of concrete. It's like a tiny half a set. Come on, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, like, it's like it's like as big as this set. I mean, our VCR repair shop. Well, well, speaking of CGI and zooming in, can I mention that this movie does what has become 
my most hated cliche of any of these movies, which is when there is a shot that is clearly completely CGI and they do the snap zoom to try and make it look like documentary and real. I think I'm, I can guarantee they do it multiple times in Man of Steel. They do it in this. Stop it. It's so, it's so tired. I want to say that may have been first used in the great film, Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones. Oh, really? That's 2002. I ain't never seen that before. Yeah. Um, so it's all CG shot that tries to look like a snap zoom like a, documentary. Like a, a war cameraman. Yeah. <laughs> but now every fucking movie does it, and it's so tired. It feels a little dated. At yeah. But That's the only thing when it comes to the big monster stuff. That was the only one that stuck out where I was like, come on. The rest of it's pretty good. Yeah, you know, compared to the last one, I think I was bored during the last one. <laughs> I remember Brian Cranston was sweating a lot. Well, that movie, every time Godzilla starts to attack, they cut to, like, news footage, and you see it on happening there. It's like, we're not going to show the monster battle. We're just showing it on TV. This movie's like, fuck that. Like, this is what people came to see. I would imagine if you're a big fan of Godzilla and, and all these monsters and stuff, like, I can't imagine not being yeah. satisfied with the amount of monster fights that are in this. Well, and, and that's, that's a good point, because I... I don't want to sound hypocritical when we say, when we, you know, knock on the Transformers movies and we say, well, people come to see big robots fight each other. That's what they get. You know what I mean? Yeah, but with those, you don't even get a coherent story. You that's, don't know what the fuck is happening. That's the thing that this movie accomplishes pretty well. It's, um, it's, it's, it's boring, cliche, melodrama stuff, but at least I understood it. It's, it's, <laughs> it's plug and play characters into your story. They didn't, they didn't go crazy. They, they really could have, that little family unit. Uh, Vera Farmiga's great. Um, she's great in everything, um, but she's a little underutilized. Um, uh, Mil M Millie, she was all right. Except for, she, she, I, I think they had a team of people giving her that wet hair look. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta have it fall just the right way for six yeah. strands this way. <laughs> that was bugging me. And another thing to note, the Michael Bay Transformers scripts, you have those those obnoxious stereotype characters, you have those those really over the top comic relief yeah, characters. They feel like they're out of a, like a Wayne's Brothers comedy yes, from the nineties. It becomes so like nauseating. Yeah. That this this movie ignored all all of that, even even that like, who's that actor? That guy with the glasses and he's got the white hair. Oh, Bradley Whitford. Is that his name? Yeah, he was, he was the dad in Get Out. He's been in yeah, tons of stuff. Yes, yes. I think he was on West Wing, one of those shows. He's got that. He's like that. He's he's kind of smart ass. He 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 teeters on going that way, but they right. never go too far with he, it. He's like an he has a, a cup. Uh, he works for Monarch, and it's like a Monarch mug, and he has this tip not yours on it. Yeah. It's a show. He's he's a nerd. He's a technical guy. He does his own, he plays by his own rules. That He's that character. He doesn't follow orders. He's, you know, a genius type, but uh, he doesn't get obnoxious. Yeah. And then the other comic relief character, they're spread in the two, is that guy. At one point, the Asian lady uh, says something. That, that creature is called Zuba Zuba. <laughs> uh, or, and then he's like, did she say gonorrhea? Oh, yeah. And her eye roll. Uh, that's the worst it got. <laughs> yeah. In terms yeah. of... Stupid comic relief. I prefer comic relief in the form of uh, a fighter pilot ejects into the mouth of a monster. <laughs> I prefer that kind of humor. And that was smarter. That's but. the type of stuff that's in, like I said, that's the best moment in this movie because it's, it's, it's silly, but it's not like distracting or obnoxious or takes you out of the movie. Um, Kong Skull Island, which I like much more than this. That whole movie is stuff like that. Oh, really, great. Really kind of like inventive, colorful set pieces. Um, a lot of it's during the day, so you can see what's happening. Unlike this movie, there's so much rain all the time. I was annoyed by that. Uh, you you want to take it take it as it is. It's a Godzilla movie about monsters, with some some boilerplate human plotting, that is necessary. Well, uh, I made uh, I don't know if it's a good decision or a mistake, uh, because it, in retrospect, it made this movie much worse. Right after watching this, just for comparison's sake, I watched Shin Godzilla. From 2016, the Japanese reboot. There hadn't been a Godzilla movie in like over a decade or something. That's a movie that has very little Godzilla, but it also has no protagonist, and it's fucking great. It's very uh, like tactical and logical, where it's like it's a complete reboot. It's like if Godzilla showed up today, what would how would everyone react? 
like like okay this giant monster just showed up on shore what do we do and so we have scenes with like the military we have scenes with the government we have scenes with scientists and it's all, all like everybody trying to work together but there's all this like political red tape so everything's taking way longer than it should and that's the whole movie and it's fucking awesome i think as like a like a star trek fan like a tng fan you would actually like it because it's very i in I, in rewatching our godzilla review from 2014, you're like, I would love to see a movie that's just scientists trying to figure out what to do. And that's the movie. Uh, I, I like a good procedural drama. That, that's what it is. Uh, a big studio here is not going to take that chance without the lovey-dovey parents and kids and, and the stupid plot with that. Because Godzilla was not made by Americans. Godzilla, and, and it does not translate all that great yeah because godzilla, godzilla is what like from the 50s it's like the whole movie is about the fear of like nuclear fallout it's, it's the, the atomic age it's uh, the collective horror of the japanese from being nuked yes. in world war ii and yeah. it's like it's like ingrained in the subculture and that's kind of what it sprung from and it's so it's like something that us as americans don't quite get so we want to see a Michael Bay kind of monsters punch each other. Look, Vera Farmiga wants to bring these monsters back to destroy cities and kill a bunch of people to redeem the death of her son. I would have been okay if, like, you know, she was just good-hearted scientist who wanted to talk to the monsters and then uh, an insane asylum bus crashes near the, the compound and we're missing one patient, Mr. Mr. Aber Aberdeen Bumbledorf. <laughs> He's super bonkers, everyone. We gotta find him. Yeah. He's hey, what's this button do? <laughs> oh no, Aberdeen Bumbledore! <laughs> You've unleashed all the monsters. <laughs> and there's your plot. Okay. Basically, what I'm saying is happenstance, accident, uh, technological failure versus uh, bonkers Bond villain esque political agenda or sure. or you know whatever agenda. Yeah. Uh, I, I just gotta switch those components around. Whatever gets the monsters out. Why did you make me do that? The worst summer season for movies is officially underway, and adding to the pile is the poorly reviewed Dark Phoenix. The third or fourth time the tale of Jean Grey going bonkers has been told. Throw in some themes of us versus them, family, teacher, student, love, hate, revenge, and you've got drama to the nth degree, complete with a blue ape. What movie couldn't use more blue apes? X-Men Dark Phoenix is the best looking TV show to ever play in the movie theaters. That was exactly what I was going to say about this movie, is that it feels like a two-parter TV show episode. It's time to open a Tank 7 by Boulevard Brewing Company. Are we sponsored by them? What is mm, happening? Absolutely not. <laughs> it's just a beer I like to drink and it's refreshing. Oh, okay. And delicious. And it, and it has 27% alcohol. Mm. Well, Jay, what did you think of X-Men Dark Phoenix? Well, like you mentioned, it kind of feels like a TV show. The script feels like, a, like an okay first draft that they didn't flesh out or make better. Like you had mentioned that you, you kind of hinted at it with the, the Godzilla discussion, but you like that it feels a little more small scale. I do to a certain extent, but with this particular story, where it hinges on the idea that Jean Grey is now the Dark Phoenix and she's turning evil and this may turn all of, of, of normal people against mutants. The movie doesn't really do anything to display that. She doesn't do anything particularly evil. She kills spoilers. Uh, she kills one of the X-Men, the worst X-Men in this franchise, uh, Jennifer Lawrence. Aside from that, she just, like, like, if you're going to really make that like the big threat, like, oh, fuck, humanity's going to turn on us again just when we got people to like us, she needs to kill like a stadium of people or something. Like, you need to have something big happen. And the movie never really goes there. Uh, I loved this movie. Oh, my God. Uh, I thought it was the best X-Men movie I've seen since X2. You're lying. I'm not lying. You are. Seriously? I am not trolling you. I, th 
I some I, people are saying it's the worst X Men movie, and it definitely isn't. This doesn't have any "I'm the Juggernaut" bitch moments. Don't you know who I am? I'm the Juggernaut, bitch. Oh God, no, um, there's so many other worse ones. X Men Origins Wolverine. Let, let me let me take let me uh, let me add some more in here. Uh, okay, so there's X Two Logan, which is more of a real movie. Yes. Um, uh, and then everything else, and then maybe Days of Future Past. Days certainly. of Future Past I liked a lot, yeah. So, I mean... I the, the bad ones you've liked, you've liked because they're just complete garbage. Well, like uh, X-Men Origins Wolverine and uh, yeah. uh, Apocalypse. What are you doing? Nothing. Well, Apocalypse of Schlock um, and, and see, I enjoy, I enjoy Schlock. This one, this one was just, there was something different about it, and I liked how it was just kind of very simple. Um, because it starts off with, uh, and kind of things have settled down. And that's, that, that's the real problem with this, this whole X-Men franchise going all the way back to 1999, 2000, the first one. 98, 99, yeah. when did that first one come out? Um, and, and it's just like, bleh, all over the place. You had, you had X, X-Men 1 and X-Men 2, Brian Singer movies. Well, yeah. We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> uh, 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 you had your cast, great cast. Yes. X2 was their Empire Strikes Back. And then Brian Singer leaves to go direct Superman Returns and says, I don't want to do X-Men 3. Give it to... That the, give it to that other sex pervert. The other sex pervert. <laughs> uh, uh, what's his name? Brett Ratner. Brett Ratner. Um, and then it's like, oh. And then, oh, God. Ah. Uh, then let's start making origin movies. Let's, uh, and oh God, let's reboot the whole thing. Let's go back in, into the past. Yeah, this franchise is all over the place. And that's like, okay, and, and spoilers, Dark Phoenix, spoilers. Uh, Mystique dies. Although I don't think it's ever been established that it's a separate, like, like splintered off timeline. It hasn't. But now Mystique dies. Oh wait, no, it has. I can't keep track of Something, this shit. Listen, um, <laughs> at the end of... Um, at the end of uh, Days of Future Past, Logan, Wolverine, returns mm. to present day. We see all those characters again. We're like, what? But they've altered the future, right? Because at the beginning of the movie, it's like a, like a dystopia. So it's like that's not the same timeline in the future from these movies? It's, it's possible we have a, 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 a Kelvin and Prime situation, although I'm not sure. Because but they're still technically the same characters, and this movie takes place in the early 90s, just a couple years before the first X-Men movie. So I don't know how Michael Fassbender looks like Ian McKellen in the course of like six years. <laughs> it's a whole lot of cocaine. <laughs> Did you hear what the kids are calling you? Phoenix. Speaking of inconsistencies, even in this timeline, things don't make sense because I only saw Apocalypse once. We saw it in the theater. Uh, and I had a vague memory of something happening at the end that I had to double check after watching this movie, which is at the end of that movie, to defeat Apocalypse, uh, James McAvoy tells Jean Grey, like, unleash it, unleash it. Go. Unleash the power, Jean. She unleashes the phoenix in that movie, mm -hmm. which takes place before this movie, where she gets the phoenix powers in this movie. Mm -hmm. What happened? They just completely ignored the ending of the last movie in this movie. X-Men 3, it was Jean Grey in, in the, you know, the singer era X-Men movies. In the pervert era? <laughs> the pervert era. Can we call that the pervert timeline? Sure. <laughs> Um, she was able to do telekinesis and do some things, but Professor X kept her mind in check yes. by, by building firewalls or safeguards in her brain. So X-Men 3, she kind of goes, I'm crazy! I, I, I've, you've got to let her loose, child. So she turns Patrick Stewart to dust. And then goes bonkers. And it's only Wolverine and his mutant healing ability that allows him to get close enough to stab her in the heart. Yeah. Uh, that's that Dark Phoenix. This Dark Phoenix is Space Entity, which is more accurate to the comic books. Uh, I don't care about accuracy to the comic books. Who I care cares? about consistency of story. Well, you can, <laughs> no. If you care about consistency of story, 
the, 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 the story contained within this little film called Dark Phoenix is consistent. But this movie doesn't exist in a vacuum. Who cares? It exists in a part of a franchise. They, they fucked up the whole prequel uh, backstory soft reboot of the X-Men from the get-go. This whole, this whole franchise is a mess. It's probably good that it's done. And you could tell. Um, you could tell. They, they're doing their best. McAvoy, Fassbender... The, well, that's that's the top the, qual quality. The only one who's really showing her disdain for being there is Jennifer Lawrence. <laughs> yes. So what? We wear matching costumes and smile in pictures that to make everyone feel safe. That's a small price for keeping the peace. By risking our people to make everyone feel safe. Well, that's the whole Mystique character originally. The idea is that she looks the way she does. She can transform into a normal human, but she doesn't. Then why not stay in disguise all the time? Because we shouldn't have to. And here she's just constantly Jennifer Lawrence because she didn't want to put on the blue makeup. She looks miserable with the blue makeup on. Yeah. To the point, early on in, in some of the early scenes, I thought that that was either a stand-in mm. who looked like her close enough to wear the makeup and then they ADR'd her voice, oh. uh, or it was a, a CG face. That's her attitude in the whole movie. When yeah, she's talking to like Xavier, she's just completely mean to you him. You could tell she's sick of doing these. Yeah. I mean, she's contractually to, obligated. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to say. Is, to be fair to her, like when she did that first one, first class, she was like a nobody. Yeah. And then she kind of blew up, and now she's like a pretty big name actress. So she's like, oh, fuck, I got to wear this blue shit again. No pun intended. Are you sure about that? But in the, if we're looking at this movie in a, in a vacuum, uh, I didn't really like what they did with Xavier. Because nope. that, that opening scene establishes Jean Grey, a little kid. Her parents are in the front. She's using her powers to change the radio station. She causes a car crash. And I was like, oh, okay, this is establishing that the Phoenix has always been with her. And she's always had this dark side. Um, and that's what Xavier is trying to, to repress. But I guess he's just repressing a traumatic experience that a normal person would have. It just seems very odd. Xavier got the shaft in this. Yes. And I'll explain why. Because everyone was yelling at him. Pictures that to make everyone feel safe. Pay for keeping the peace. Peace. By risking our people to make everyone feel safe. Because we're taking bigger. He did nothing wrong. He's the only one keeping this shit together. Yeah. He, when he, Jennifer Lawrence is like, like the, the men never, the women always have to save the men. I was like, he's in a fucking wheelchair to save all of you people. What are you talking about? He's, do, <laughs> he's doing his best to... Like, that's why I, I, I love that opening scene when they go up and rescue the astronauts. I, was, that was very x men -y. It was like, I like, like that stuff. Call in the X-Men. It's the president. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're up to space to say, and then that, that little sequence, or the night crawlers jumping in, grabbing the astronauts, and they rescue everybody. I was like, hey, this is fun. And then they get, and that, that's, that's. Patrick. Everyone's using their power for specific uses. Right. Of it's course. good stuff. Yeah, that's what they work as a team. Yes. That, this, that was always the theme of the X-Men. As teamwork, unless you're Wolverine. Excuse me, I'm Eric Lentra. Tell Xavier. Go fuck yourself. And Xavier has, has basically kind of achieved his dream of running a school, working alongside human beings. Um, and then Jean Grey gets infected with the violent space alien, and everyone blames him yeah. for, for not being able to control her and for also having the gall to control her. Yes. And he's like, I just wanted, I was like, just shout from the hilltops, James McAvoy, she's got a fucking space alien in here. I have nothing to do with this. Everybody, there's an evil space creature in her. He's, oh, I did my best. It got a little dramatic. You know? She has a car accident to parents. And yeah. No, she's fine. Everything was fine until a space alien came. Yeah. So, and well, that, that's why, like, the idea of, I, I mean, I know it wouldn't be true to the comics, but, like, that opening scene I thought was hinting that she's always had this darker side, and that's what right. Xavier's trying to repress. But the fact that that's not the case makes Xavier look like a dick for just repressing the fact that her dad's still alive and this traumatic event. It's a little muddled. Um, it's, it's very muddled. Uh, so that, that was, got crossed and that's yeah. the entire premise of the movie, so that's a problem. Right. I thought, in terms of of telling a smaller scale story that felt like television. I mean, TV shows look like they have bigger budgets. Yeah. I enjoyed that. Someday we're going to get Marvel level X-Men battles. 
and and mm. we will. I mean, no, we will. I'm I'm saying I don't know if I want that. Right. I, uh, that's why I was okay. There, there's with a lot this. of things in this that I prefer. Like I mentioned, I think in this particular story, you need at least one kind of larger scale event to happen. I guess. Um, yeah. If you're, you're looking at it from a story perspective, yeah, I, I'm kind of looking at it from a. Uh, this movie's not exhausting. Uh, yes, <laughs> from from a kind of like a, a simpler X Men storyline. Yeah, when they're all fighting in front of Jean Grey's dad's house, that was great. Yeah, I like that little sequence. It, it all these X Men movies always have, always feel a little reserved in terms of going too far over the top with the action. Yeah, well, and they never went the the villain of the week route. Sure. That all these other big comic book movies do. Mm-hmm. It's always just about the kind of conflict between Xavier and uh, Magneto. And I, I, I liked Magneto in this probably more than any other movie. I just loved his like angle. Um, I loved that uh, Beast went rogue. There was it was it was it, it had a lot of darkness in it um, and like kind of the end of an era, which it is. Yeah. Um, because uh, Mystique was wanting to leave. They're questioning you know, whether or not all the fame and stuff was appealing to Xavier's vanity or if he really was trying, still trying to achieve his dream. Which that was weird, too, because I was like, I don't think there was anything in any of the other movies to hint at anything like that. That kind of came out of nowhere. But that was, that's, that's where Mystique's character is. Yeah. She's not uh, a soldier. She's not a cyclops who just follows orders. Right. She's more of a, a lone wolf kind of character, which is why she always gravitated towards being a bad guy. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, all those, all those elements were in play, and uh, I thought it was very serviceable and enjoyable I enjoyed, for an X-Men movie. I enjoyed the train action scene at the end, because it was yeah. just on a train. Right. Did you know that entire thing was reshot? So I think maybe the original idea is they were supposed to go up into space with Jessica Chastain and her group aliens, whatever those guys are, and then she turns into Laser Lady and saves the day. I, I, I don't know for sure, but I know that entire ending is a reshoot. Hmm. Um, and it's the most exciting part of the movie. I guess we won't talk about the dreadlock guy. Oh, uh, yeah. Because, uh, yeah. Uh, Whatever. Kind of a goofy character. Yeah. Uh, he, his mutant powers is dreadlocks. He has dreadlocks that can whip around, I guess. I don't know. A cu- pick a couple of cooler henchmen. All the, all the bad guys in this movie, the Jessica Chastain and all of her oh, henchmen, they were all weak. The Groot aliens, yeah. whatever they were, yeah. And that was a budgetary thing. It's like, oh, that, it looked like people. Yeah. They should have been aliens in, like, big battle armor. They should have looked like the Herogians. Maybe they were. I mean, that, like I said, the entire ending was a reshoot, so maybe the original ending of the movie was more grand. Who knows? It would have been funny if it was, it was all reshot and, and they were actors wearing, like, those, those dot suits. The motion capture yeah, suits? Yeah, like they they had the green spandex on with like mocap dots and like a head thing, <laughs> like an eye, and, and, and they said they tried to pass it off as their, their, <laughs> their alien uniforms. <laughs> There's like one off-camera ADR line that mentions that. They, have, they certainly have weird alien costumes. <laughs> that would have been so awesome. But as far as the little, I like the little set piece was... was uh, uh, Magneto pulls the subway car out of the ground, and oh yeah, that, I was thinking of Ghostbusters because it's in New York and like yeah. the ground breaks open. Um, but it, like you mentioned, it feels like a TV show because that whole scene. It is in New York, but it's just on like this tiny street set. It's very small scale, um, and I was I was fine with that. I was fine with the end taking place just on a train. And I, I still someday will hope to see the full extent of Professor Xavier's powers. Mm. And during that whole battle, all he could do was concentrate on one character at a time and just sort of distract them momentarily. Yeah. When really he could just stop everyone from moving (laughs) or make them all kill themselves instantaneously. (laughs) You know what I mean? He has the ability to do like much greater things, but he doesn't. I don't know. Well, that's that's a a storytelling problem where you're like, well, then we don't have a movie. Yeah, yeah. It is. It is. That's why they got Captain Marvel out of uh, Avengers Endgame for most of it. She's all powerful. She can kill all these people. With, just just fly through and kill everybody in a second. She's got to go do something on another planet. She'll kill us all. I, I like this movie. Okay. I, d- I don't hate it. I don't think it, w- it wasn't schlock bad. 
like no. where I enjoyed it on that I, level. I think that was my, it was just, it was very bland. It felt a little dated, you know, maybe 10, 15 years old. It felt kind of like that Fantastic Four movie with Jessica Alba. Oh, this was much better than that. No, no, no. You talk about production like, wise. Oh, okay. Where it's okay. like you, you see, there's a little set piece uh, yeah. on, on the Golden Gate Bridge. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, some rubble <laughs> falls and something. Uh, you know, it, you know, it's not a Marvel movie. No. It's not a Russo Brothers Marvel movie. And that's fine. The, that's this, fine. The, the stuff I liked in this movie was when it was just like the X Men working as a team and, you know, yes. like the, the opening scene in space, the, the stuff on the train was fun. When Nightcrawler just like goes fucking crazy and starts murdering people, like. I was fine with all that. It's a lot of the connecting stuff and like the way they treat the Xavier character. Throwing, they threw Xavier under the bus, yes. more or less, so that they could cross their fingers and hope, because like, they set it up for potential, potential sequel territory because they renamed the school like the... Oh yeah, the Jean Grey The something. Jean Grey School for the Gifted Youngsters. They basically yeah. take off Xavier's name. He quits for failing in his dream, which is the core of the X-Men. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and which has sort of, uh, and then uh, uh, Beast, Hank McCoy, takes over as head professor. Yeah. With the giant picture of a dead woman on his desk staring at him. The, dying, the giant uh, promotional still. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> trying to do some, ah! <laughs> Put it on the wall over there. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, so there's that. But, you know, Fastbender, top notch. What's his face? <laughs> McAvoy. McAvoy's always good. Everybody's good. And then now, you, you've yeah 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 you burn through these properties so fast. Mm -hmm. you, you you cannot do this this Dark Phoenix shit anymore. At least not for twenty more years. <laughs> well, this is the second time they've done it. You got you, you did you did Apocalypse. I feel like I know the the Logan movie like that was the you know that was the Wolverine movie but that to me kind of felt like the end of this whole era of it and then oh and then we also have this movie where they fight and train at the end this almost feels like an afterthought I'm still waiting for us to get another X-Men Origins movie well, there's rumors of a Tatum Channing Channing Tatum oh Gambit yeah. I think that's long dead yeah. It's all long dead now. Everything in the world is owned by Disney. I don't know what to tell you, Jay. A, a monopoly where, where one company owns every property. People are excited because now the X-Men can be in a Marvel movie. I, I heard just a couple of days ago, Disney also bought Hasbro. Oh, oh, okay. So they now own the monopoly on Monopoly. So Mike, uh, sounds like you would recommend Dark Phoenix. I loved it. <laughs> it's okay. You know what? It, it's we don't have movies anymore that are just okay. Where it's like okay for a movie to be okay. You talk about like, oh, I watched this movie. It was on cable the other day. It was okay. I enjoyed watching it while it was on cable. Every movie has to be fucking amazing now. Yeah. And both of these movies are okay-ish. They they. They did their job. Godzilla was a Godzilla movie. Yeah. Godzilla fought other monsters, and humans kind of ran around and helped the plot along. Yeah. It was serviceable. It provided what it promised. It didn't annoy you, and it wasn't obnoxious. Yeah. And didn't didn't make you want to kill yourself. And and there was care taken with the monsters, which is the most important part. Yes. And and X Men, we got to see the X Men doing their thing. There's a little Jean Grey. Uh, Dark Phoenix storyline. Magneto was in it. <laughs> Magneto. I got to see Cyclops fight Magneto. Um, I'm a sucker for X-Men schlock. I'll take, I'll take it. <laughs> now, earlier in the show, I was a little upset about us not getting an invite to the soft open Oh, sure, sure. For the, the VCR Hall of Fame Museum. And I just want to say, uh, nobody told me you know, to apologize for my, my outburst about being really fucking mad about not being invited to the VCR Hall of Fame opening. Uh, I just want to make it clear, nobody, nobody told me uh, from Lightning Fest VCR Corporate that I have to apologize for that. But, you know, I was just, I was just impassioned. 
let's say impassioned. Anger is not the best word, impassioned, because you and I are at the forefront of VCR repair. And, you know, they don't invite us. And I wasn't asked by anyone to apologize. Yeah. But, you know, when that museum opens, I'm not going. That museum can go fuck itself. And I know this is an apology for, for the outburst earlier. This is an apology, but we were in the right. We were in the right to be upset. So it's not really an apology. Lightning fast VCR repair, this is Mike. Okay. Tim wants you to talk about the VCR repair museum.